Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Basilovich from the Elk Ridge branch of the Howard County Library System. Welcome to Indigenous Voices in Middle School Literature. And I wanted to share some of my favorite books that are written by uh, Indigenous authors and um, or are about Indigenous culture, history. Um, I think there might be one here that is not written by someone who is an Indigenous author, uh, but she did have sensitivity readers and there is a reason why I chose her particular book. Okay, so let's get started. I hope you love these books as much as I do. This may very well be my favorite book for possibly the entire year. It's called Aletso A by Darcy Little Badger. That is her last name. She is Lipon Apache. And this is essentially a mystery. I will explain this a little bit more, but first let's have the author talk about her book. Hello, I'm Darcy Little Badger, the author of Alatsoe, a young adult fantasy mystery about a lip on Apache teen named Ellie who investigates the death of her cousin in a really creepy South Texas town that is none too willing to give up its many secrets. Now Ellie is helped by her friends and family. She's also helped by her ghost dog Kirby because she has the ability to wake up the ghosts of animals, which is a skill that's been passed down through generations of the women in her family. Now, I was inspired to write this book by many questions. One of them is how cool would it be if you could teach a ghost dog or a ghost woolly mammoth how to do supernatural tricks? And another question is how does a young woman like Ellie seek justice for somebody she loves in a world that so often seems to be stacked against her? So I hope you enjoy reading a Latsway and thank you so much for listening. It is such a fabulous book. Elasoe, or Ellie, as she's called in the book, gets a dream. And in the dream, her cousin, who is older than her, but they were very close growing up, he tells her that he was killed. And he tells her who killed him and asks her to seek justice for him and to also take care and protect his newborn infant and his wife, his widow. And in this world, magic exists and all of the lore, the magic and the stories surrounding many of our religions and cultures, they're all real in some way. For example, vampires exist. It is a disease, they are considered cursed. And there is a cure, but it is so expensive. And in America, the healthcare system does not cover it. So there's a lot of layers to this book. And she does go to uh, live with her cousin's widow, with her mom to help take care of them. And to also be there for that cycle of grief and uh, burial. And she's going to look for ways to prove that her cousin was killed by the person that he told her. And she can summon ghosts. Um, now in the Lapan Apache uh, culture, you should not ever call up the ghost of a human though, because they know that they are dead. Uh, another thing really interesting about her is she loves, loves, loves paleontology. And so she also has a pet ghost um, trilobite. And she's very interested in like uh, the author said, woolly mammoths and dinosaurs. And it's a lot of fun. And this book is a little scary at the end, but not very. So I have this other book as a companion. It's called The Ghost Collector by Allison Mills. And there are some similarities. Uh, they both have strong female characters and they both, both can see ghosts. But the difference is in The Ghost Collector, Shelley does not summon the ghosts into being. She actually does the opposite. She sets them free. Her grandmother actually makes a living at this. And this was an ability or is an ability that has passed down 
to uh, the female generations, just like in the other book. But in this particular novel, Shelley's mother has rejected this gift, okay? Literally cut it out of her by cutting her hair. Um, and here is a quote from the book. If you carry your ghosts in your hair, you can cut them off when you don't need them anymore. Otherwise, ghosts cling to your skin, dig their fingers in under your ribs, and stay with you long, long after you want them gone. So in this book, which is written by Allison Mills, who is Cree, the, and the Cree um, culture, um, has this legend and uh, lore of being able to capture ghosts in your hair. And that's what Shelley does. That's what her grandmother does. And then normally it says easy is going out and brushing your hair and then setting that to set them free. Sometimes you do have to do something drastic like actually physically cutting your hair. Um, there are, there's a funny bit in the beginning where there is a neighbor who knocks on the door and says, I believe that we are haunted. Please, please help us. We keep hearing these terrible, scary noises at night. And so they come over to help. And sure enough, they say, you are indeed haunted. And now the family is curious, well, who is this ghost? Or are they more than one? Oh, there's more than one. What, what happened to them? You know, how did they die? How did they die? They were eaten by your cats, that's how. They were mice. And so Shelly had to put her hair down the heating vent to get them all collected, to release them. Again, there's some serious humor in this book. Her mom won't let her have a cat, but that doesn't include cat ghosts, right? So she's gonna become the, the teenage equivalent of the crazy cat lady, but with cat ghosts. It is a fun book, except that it is also a book about grieving because early in the book, her mother does die. There's a terrible, terrible accident. And at first, Shelly is, is deeply upset, yes, but she also expects to see her mom because her mom has this ability too, and she knows that Shelly will be waiting for her, so she will appear, right? Right? She waits for her all night in her bed, and her mother does not show. This book is about the process of grieving and how it sneaks up on you, and it's really difficult. I love both of those books quite a bit. The next one is I Am Not a Number, and this is a biography. It is an illustrated novel, um, and it takes place in Canada. Uh, the Nipissing First Nation um, is uh, the nation that is uh, represented here. I have a short video to share. I Am Not a Number is a story written by Jenny K. Dupuy and Kathy Kaser and is illustrated by Jillian Newland. It is a true and personal story about an eight-year-old girl named Irene. The author, Jenny Dupuy, is a member of the Nipissing First Nations. She wrote this story based on the experience of her grandmother, Irene, as a young girl who attended a residential school. Young Irene and her family lived together on the Nipissing First Nations Reserve. Although they didn't have much, they never went hungry. They were a happy, close-knit family living together on their land. The family, content with their life on the reserve, were torn apart the day the state agent knocked on the door of their home. The state agent was a man paid by the government to round up school-aged Aboriginal children from their homes. The man threw the door open and declared to the family, The children are going with me to the residential school. They are wards of the government now. They belong to us. The parents did everything they could to keep their precious children with them, but they had no choice. Their children had to go. Just as the children walked towards the bus to leave, 
their mother told them something very important. Never forget our home or our ways. Never forget us. And never forget who you are. What makes you who you are anyway? What characteristics attribute to your identity? Is it your hair, your language, your clothing? Irene was confused about her mother's statement. What did she mean, never forget who you are? Why would she forget who she was? Irene and her two brothers were forced to get on the bus and were taken far away to a residential school, leaving their home, parents, and everything they knew behind. At the school, Irene was separated from her brothers and was alone in a new and scary place. Can you imagine being ripped from your home and the people you love as you attend a new school in an unfamiliar place? How would you react? How would you feel inside? Residential schools were a real part of Canada's history. It all began in the 1870s, over 100 years ago, when the Canadian government partnered with the church to run these schools strictly for Aboriginal children. The goal of the residential schools was to kill the Indian and save the man. This means that the people in charge of the schools wanted to try as best as they could to remove the child's Indian identity. They hoped to eliminate all aspects of their Aboriginal culture. Those who attended and their families are still impacted by the devastating effects of residential schools. At the school, Irene's hair was chopped short. As she watched her long locks fall around her, she felt as if a part of her was dying with every strand that fell. Irene was given a number, 759, and was no longer referred to by her first name. How would you feel if these aspects of who you are were seen as wrong and shameful? At the school, Irene was in the shower. Sister Mary hollered, Make sure to scrub all the brown off! But was it even possible for her to wash the color off her own skin? Irene stared at her skin, wondering if Sister Mary liked lighter-skinned girls better. Why didn't these people like her for who she was? The students were forbidden to speak their home language, the only language they knew. Irene was caught whispering her home language, language to another child at the school. When Sister Mary overheard, she took her away and lowered a bedpan of hot coals onto Irene's hands as punishment. That'll teach you to speak only English here! You should be ashamed of yourself! They were required to wear a uniform, and in the end lost their individual identity. All students, boys and girls, appeared the same as the other. While Irene sat alone and scared, she wondered if she could ever make it back home. Irene was steered away from her home language, culture, and way of life. She began to lose sight of her own identity. Irene wondered if a number was all she was. Do you think Irene ever made it home again to her loving parents? How do you think this experience affects Irene today? Read the book to find out how Irene's own granddaughter, Jenny Dupuy, shares her important story. And it is very important. Moreover, residential schools were not exclusive to, to Canada. They were here in this nation as well. The next book is historical and we have it in a variety of different formats. It's called Code Talker by Joseph Brock. And um, it is about um, a Navajo or Diné, that's what they call themselves. And um, a young boy who was taken from his home and goes to one of these schools and is given a new name um, Ned Begay. And again, much like in this first book, he was forced to shun and forget who he was. And many there forgot their language. He did not. He, he did retain quite a bit of his language. Uh, he did return when he was a little bit older, and that story is going to follow him returning as a teenager and there not being a lot of opportunities at that time, uh, especially for those of, of color and living on the reservation and the poverty and hopelessness that was felt and that disconnect from their culture. And then World War II it occurs and many 
in the Navajo Nation want to join. He does, he wants to do something. Um, and the military, specifically the Marines, come to his village and start recruiting for something very special. Code talkers. I have a video here. And this is true. These this did happen. The Marine Corps began recruiting Navajo code talkers, which were Navajo Native Americans who used obscure languages as a means of secret communication during wartime between 1941 and 1942. The Marines' primary job was to use their knowledge of Native American languages as a basis to transmit coded tactical messages. Philip Johnston was a World War I veteran who had heard about the successes of the Choctaw Telephone Squad, which was a group of Choctaw Native Americans who pioneered the use of Native American language as military code. Johnston, although not Native American, had grown up on a Navajo reservation. In 1942, he suggested to the Marine Corps that the Navajos and other tribes could be very helpful in maintaining secret communications. After viewing a demonstration of messages sent in the Navajo language, the Marine Corps was so impressed that they recruited 29 Navajos in two weeks to develop a code within their language. Code words had to be short and easily learned and recalled. The men developed a two-part code. A 26-letter phonetic alphabet used Navajo names for 18 animals or birds, plus the words ice, the letter I, nut, N, quiver, Q, ute, U, victor, V, cross, X, yucca, Y, and zinc for Z. The second part was a 211-word English vocabulary with Navajo synonyms. Conventional Marine Corps codes involved lengthy encoding and deciphering procedures using sophisticated electronic equipment. The Navajo code, relying on the sender's and the receiver's brains, mouths, and ears, was much faster. In training and in combat, code talkers' proficiency erased general distrust. After the Navajo Code was developed, the Marine Corps established a code talking school. As the war progressed, more than 400 Navajos were eventually recruited as code talkers. The training was intense. Following their basic training, the code talkers completed extensive training in communications and memorizing the code. This secret, unbreakable code language that was used to send information on tactics, troop movements, and orders over the radio and telephone was indecipherable to the enemy and a key factor in the American military victories at Iwo Jima, Saipan, and several other major battles in the Pacific Theater. The deployment of the Navajo Code Talkers continued through the Korean War and was ended early in the Vietnam War. The Navajo Code is the only spoken military code never to have been deciphered. And that is true. Unfortunately, because it was so very successful, they were ordered by the military not to reveal the fact that they were uh, in the um, World War II or their role or their language. So when Ned Begay returned, it was to this terrible disillusionment and yes, racism from the time. And that persisted, that silence for many, many, many years. Um, so they were uh, finally recognized for their contributions in the war, uh, but still fairly recently. It is a very good book. Um, there are some graphic scenes because Ned Begay does go overseas. He participates in the Pacific theater warfare and he does see quite a lot of battle, but it is powerful and he is an amazing hero. So Indian No More um, is a fabulous book. It's written by Charlene Willing uh, McManus and excuse me, McManus and Tracy um, uh, Storrell, Sorrell. Let me just pull my glasses and make sure I, I said that right. Yes, Sorrell. Um, I do want to say that the book, um, Charlene unfortunately died during the writing of this book. Uh, and she, while she is Umqua and the story is about um, and Umqua, Tracy is Chippewa. So she was tapped to finish the book and it feels very seamless. It is a, a sad story, but very potent. Um, this is also historic. It takes place in 1957, so later than the last book. And I have a video here.
Regina Petit lives with her mom, dad, little sister, and grandmother on the Grand Ronde Tribe Reservation. Her family is Umpqua. That is, until the U.S. government decided that their tribe no longer existed and erased their reservation off the map. That happened. As part of the relocation program, Regina and her family moved to a suburb of Los Angeles, where she meets kids of different races for the very first time. She is also the first Native American they've ever met, and they ask if she is a real Indian like on TV, which is confusing because everything on the TV is wrong. Regina and her family must navigate loss, a new community, racism, and what it means to be Umpqua or American, or is it even possible to be both? Find out in Indian No More, our Charlene Willing McManus with Tracy Sorrell. So there is um, a scene in here where uh, she gets thrown out of a restaurant for being a person of color. And she had never, ever been exposed to this kind of racism because she was raised there uh, with other Umqua. So this is very disturbing to her. It is a powerful story. And yes, she does build some friendships, but it is, uh, it is quite sad. What's interesting too, is it does show you a lot of different problems inherent in the system, not just um, her own. So she can see she grows up very quickly. The next one here is I Can Make This Promise by Christine Day. This is realistic fiction, and there are some similarities. Yes, strong female characters. Um, um, it takes place in different areas of the country uh, with different tribes represented, but there are some similarities. Now, this Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978 was meant to, uh, to help because there were so many situations in which um, children of indigenous parents, when they were fostered or adopted, they were sent to homes that were white or just not indigenous, so they lost their culture. So they were trying to make some amends. So I just wanted to give you a preface there in case you weren't familiar with that. Eddie is half white and half Native American and lives in Seattle. Her mom is Native American but was adopted by a white family so she never knew about her heritage, or so she says. When Eddie and her friends find a box in the attic, they come across a photo of a woman that looks exactly like Eddie and has the same name too. When Eddie starts asking family members about her, it seems like no one is ready to tell her the truth. It doesn't help that Eddie just got braces and her and her best friend Amelia seems to be drifting apart. What is it about this mysterious woman that makes her own parents lie to her? It looks like Eddie will have to find her own answers. Will she ever find out her connection to her past? Find out in I Can Make This Promise by Christine Day. Uh, it's a wonderful story, um, and I like how the author pairs the um, Regina's growth in middle school and how when you are getting into middle school, you start to, to change. You might get different friendships. You start to really come into your own identity, and she pairs that personal journey also with this mystery of learning her ancestral mystery. So this is a fabulous book. Everybody should read this. It's so much fun. If you like Percy Jackson and you love mythology, this is a book you should read. It's called Race to the Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. Before I show you this video with uh, an interview uh, with the author, Rebecca Roanhorse, um, I want to say that the main character is Navajo and this takes place. Um, it's really a romp through a lot of Navajo stories. The main character is someone who can see monsters. And monsters are not always hairy and covered in warts or clawed 
or covered in, in um, horns or they're not always ugly. In fact, they often look like people, handsome, attractive people, shapeshifters. But she has the ability to see. And when one shows up at her basketball game and approaches her father, she knows that's a monster. And she tries to warn her father. He does not believe her. And then her father is abducted. So this is essentially a quest story, right? And it has all those elements that you would expect in a quest. She goes with her friends. Well, one is her brother and a friend. And she's going to have a series of trials, right, to test her. And along the way, she's going to learn about the stories and um, who she really is. And you may not be familiar. I didn't know about the legend of the hero twins. Okay. And there are other legends within this book. And I strongly recommend reading this book to learn about those stories. Um, and it's her job to get to essentially the house of the sun in time, because there is a, a time element. And I want to share this interview with the author. It's being conducted by the author. Well, it's such a treat to be here with Rebecca Rollenhorst, the author of Race to the Sun, fantastic fantastic middle grade adventure novel. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for having me. So just for readers who might not be um, versed in it, uh, the term Diné. Diné is the Navajo word for themselves okay. <laughs> for the Diné. And uh, so it just means like the people. What is it about the Diné tales that that really makes them unique? So I am not Diné. I'm Okewenge, which mm -hmm. is a neighboring tribe. But my husband is Diné. My first encounter with the stories was actually through law. Mm -hmm. um, I took a class in uh, Navajo law in law school, and uh, the professor was actually um, a chief uh, justice of the Navajo Supreme Court. And he came into class and he put the books, these books down and he said, learn these. And they were all the Navajo traditional stories. He said, you can't understand Navajo law. You can't understand Navajo culture until you understand the stories that it's based on. Yeah. So can, can you start by just giving us um, a little look at what Race to the Sun is about? What, sure. what is the book? So this follows uh, our protagonist and she is a Navajo girl living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But it's about her uh, sort of finding her own way through the world and sort of fighting off monsters, both real uh, and sort of internal. The reader gets to go on this adventure through uh, Navajo traditional stories, meeting all sorts of characters and, and beings and, and places that most people probably aren't familiar with. So let's talk about your main character, Nijane Begay. Mm -hmm. So does the name have uh, a particular significance and, and how did you pick it? Yeah, so Nijone is the Navajo word for beauty. Okay. And so in Navajo culture, beauty is very important. Uh, there are ceremonies around uh, beauty. You walk in beauty. Uh, that's sort of like the the way that, you know, you wish people well, you know, in the world. There's sometimes the idea of the hero who has a fatal flaw, the Achilles heel, the thing they have to overcome. Would you say Nijone has a fatal flaw? Uh, and what would it be if so? Yeah. You know, I think actually hers is anger. Mm -hmm. I think that she's so angry uh, because her mother has left her. And mm -hmm. um, that's not a secret. That happens early in the book. Yeah. Um, you know, just because the things that she sees in her life that she believes are unfair. She has sort of this, this anger management <laughs> issue. And so I think that's the flaw that she has to overcome. She has mm -hmm. to see that, you know, the world is rough. And so she heard part of her lesson and these trials that she has to go through in the book is to learn that she also has herself as well and her inner strength. Speaking of the characters and how kids can see themselves in those characters, let's talk about Davery. Mm -hmm. Because right away, as a former school teacher, I knew that kid. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I said, this is such a fantastic character. Tell us a little bit about Davery and what he's like. Sure. So Davery is Najona's best friend. And, you know, he's very studious. He's a rule follower. 
Uh, and he's always sort of bringing Najone back. Like when she's about to go off on a tangent or sort of like go off somewhere, he's sort of bringing her back to reality. Uh, and he's also half Navajo and half black. And it was really important to me because I am half okay when gay and half black. If I hear readers say, you know, that's like my little brother, or that sounds just like my sister, you know, that I got the details right and they could see themselves in the book. I think that's, that's when I know I did a good job. That's perfect. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about monster slaying. Um, I noticed that this is a theme that is, is very important to you, both in your uh, books for older readers and in A Race to the Sun. Is there something specific about that idea that, that speaks to you as a writer? A lot of traditional stories and a lot of cultures have stories of monster slayers. And you can see why our ancestors would have stories of, of monster slaying, because they were probably very threatened uh, by, you know, the fauna and the flora and the natural world, you know, around them. But I think it still resonates to us today because we fight our own monsters. We're still fighting monsters. And then we also have our own internal monsters, you know. And I think for Najone, fighting, you know, the loss of her mother, the unfairness that she sees in the world around her, she really has to learn to fight those as well. Were there particular themes, Diné themes perhaps, um, that you were working with in the mm. book that you wanted to get across? Yeah, you know, I think on the sort of surface side, I really wanted to talk about care of the land, and the importance of family. Overall, I just wanted to write a contemporary Native story with a, a girl who might be just like a girl you know in seventh grade, yeah. except she's Navajo, you know? But she loves spaghetti, and she plays basketball, which are both really actually huge Native things that most people don't realize. And then I touch on some things I feel are um, very Native experience things like generational trauma and, and loss and mm. things like that. Mm. But at a kid level. At a kid level. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah. And you we'll do see. it beautifully. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, Rebecca, thank you so much for your time. It was great talking to you, and I cannot wait for readers to get to know Nijan Begay and Race to the Sun. Thank you so much. I'm excited, too. I strongly recommend that series. And that's what it's going to be, a series. And we have this in a lot of different um, versions. So Stone River Crossing by Tim Tingle. Tim Tingle is Choctaw, and the main character, Martha Tom, is also Choctaw. And this is also historical. This is set earlier than the other books, 1804, so prior to the Civil War. And one morning, uh, Martha is asked by her mother to gather uh, blueberries. There's going to be a wedding in their Choctaw village and they need blueberries and could she please go and get them. So she goes out but the birds have already taken many of the blueberries and she sees across this river that it's the Bok Chido River which is very wide, very fast moving, very dangerous, extremely dangerous. But across the river, way, way, way across, there are blueberries still on the bushes. And here's the thing. She knows of a secret bridge, one that has been a secret in her tribe for a very long time. So there is a natural stone bridge, the stone sort of piled up in such a way that they go all the way across um, and you can walk across them, um, but you, your feet would be a little bit in the water. You cannot really see them. The, the water is pretty dark to begin with. You cannot see those stones. So they keep that a secret because so long as that is there, you know, they can move across. But if the, um, the white men find out about it, they might come across the river and um, they might not be safe anymore. So she goes across, even though she knows she's not supposed to, she's been told many times. Why? Because it is, there's a slave labor camp over there. And if the slavers find her, she will be enslaved. They won't care that she is Choctaw. Um, so she does, and she gets lost because she starts eating the blueberries. They're really, really good and it's warm and it's nice. And there's so many that she can get lots and lots for the wedding and still eat some, right? 
Fortunately, um, there is a young enslaved boy who sees her, finds her, sees that she's upset and offers to help her. Now, this is at great risk, right? Because someone had to go out um, and basically sneak her across, you sneak her back to where um, she, uh, or her little river crossing is. And if they get caught, they're going to be in trouble. And that means physical trouble. They will get beaten or worse, but they help her. And then because little Mo is a little bit younger than Martha, they become friends and she goes back over quite a bit and they hang out and they talk, they talk about their uh, cultures and their religions and what they like to do, their families. And they learn quite a bit about each other, which is very interesting to them. But then there is terrible news. Uh, little Mo's mother will be sold. Um, is scheduled to be sold on the slave auction block. So he goes to her for help and asks for her help. And she goes to her, her parents and then her elders and asks to shelter them. They agree. Again, this is a huge risk, right? Because if they are found to be sheltering escaped slaves, they could lose their lives but they do. Now this book has a little bit of magical realism. It is lovely. It is a fast read. It would also make for a really good read aloud. The next book um, that I, I, I have is going to be not is nonfiction. Did you know that more than 20,000 American Indians served in the Civil War? It's true. The next book I have, it's Deadly Aim, The Civil War Story of Michigan's Anishinaabe Sharpshooters by Sally M. Walker. So initially, the Union Army did not allow Native Americans to uh, participate, to uh, enroll, enlist in the Army. However, they soon learned that many did not know which end of the gun was which, there were very few uh, recruits that could sh shoot straight, even a little bit. And the Anishinaabe Indians were sharpshooters. Understand many of the tribes were still hunting they were using that skill to <laughs> survive, literally. And they were very, very talented. So the Union Army reversed course and invited them to um, enroll in the, the Army to enlist. And so they did. And this book, it's narrative. It reads like a story. And it essentially follows four different people and, and their their different journeys and how those journeys became entwined and how they participated and were heroic at many of the major battles in the Civil War. I think that this is absolutely outstanding. Okay, so the next one that I have is a graphic novel. I love graphic novels. This is A Girl Called Echo. We have several of the, the volumes already. This is, um, the Pemmican Wars is the name of the series. And Pemmican, if you're not familiar with that, it's a food and it's made of dried meat uh, mixed with dried fruit, okay? And Echo is living in a foster home and she is a member of the Metis tribe, but she's not really familiar. It does take place initially, initially in the present, okay? So this is actually a fantasy, a time travel fantasy because she's sitting there in history class and suddenly boom she's magically sent back and she's in the middle of a bison hunt in the Saskatchewan prairie and at first she thinks she's she's kind of lost it right but all of her senses are telling her that this is real and then she comes back after a little while to the present again. And then she goes back to the past 
and she goes on all kinds of adventures. She follows the fur trade and the trade routes, and she gets to start to learn the history of her people. And then when she goes back in time, she ends up in the middle of a conflict, the Pemmican Wars. So that was a wars, plural. Um, think of many skirmishes, conflicts between rival companies, okay, trading companies. And um, each one wanted to have the rights. They, the one company said the Metis tribe were, was not allowed to trade pemmican anymore. But that would mean they would pretty much starve. They needed this money and they needed um, the food. So they protested and went to war. And there she is, Echo, this 13 year old who doesn't know what to do. It is very powerful. And she's a very strong, resilient, smart character. The next one is also nonfiction and also a very strong, heroic main character, okay? Um, Marooned in the Arctic, the true story of Ada Blackjack, the female Robinson Crusoe by Peggy Cervantes. And this book is actually written in her words pretty much because the author went back and is using her diary and is using all of the primary sources from the time, which do include photographs as well. What I love about this book though, is <laughs> Ada has a, a very sharp sense of wit. She is funny, um, sometimes even sarcastic. And she will tell the men, she, she, she records in her diary that she has told the men, that basically that's a dumb idea and you can get hurt and she is ignored because she is a woman and Inuit. So I have a little bit of a video here to share. Ada was born on May 10th 1898 in Solomon, Alaska, but later moved to Nome at a young age. Even though she was a Native American, she was raised by missionaries who taught her English and trained her how to cook, sew, and read the Bible. At the age of 16, Ada married a local dog musher named Jack Blackjack, and together they had three children. Unfortunately, the two died young, and only one survived. His name was Bennett. After the tragic death of their two children, their relationship grew apart, and after five years together, they decided to get a divorce. Ada, being a single mother at 21, and without any relative to rely on, she made a tough decision to leave five-year-old Bennett, who was suffering tuberculosis at the time, at a local orphanage, and she vowed to bring him back after she made enough money. Ada worked as a housekeeper for a couple of months, but the pay was so little that it was not enough to support for two people. Desperate to look for decent pay, she accepted a job from a Canadian explorer named Wilhelmer Stephenson to be part of his expedition crew. Stephenson also hired Alan Crawford, Fred Maurer, Lorne Knight, and Milton Gale. The objective was to reach the Wrangell Island, an island located in the Arctic Ocean. Their mission was to survey the landscape and live there for a year to claim it for Canada. Stephenson handpicked the crew the four men were responsible for hunting, as well as map surveying, and Ada's job was to cook for the crew and repair damaged clothes. At the end of the trip, she was guaranteed to get paid $600, around $7,200 in today's money. Stephenson himself didn't join the expedition. He merely funded the mission and provided six months of food supplies. Apart from them, the five crew were also accompanied by a party of native people to guide them in their trip. But on September 9, 1921, as soon as they landed on the Wrangell Island, all the native people on the ship decided back down since they thought that it was too dangerous. Since Ada was in need for money, she still proceeded with the mission as well as the four other men. Also, they brought along the ship's cat named Victoria with them. Throughout the trip, Ada kept a diary to record her activities, 
one of the first things she wrote upon arrival was, I thought at first that I would turn back, but I decided it wouldn't be fair to the boys. For the first few months on the island, it went smoothly. They built tents as well as igloos for them to sleep in, and they set up meteorological instruments to do their research. Crawford and Maurer hunted walruses and arctic foxes for food and used their skin for clothing. Everything was just as planned. They only had to stay on the island for a year, then a ship would pick them up. However, after the summer ended, they encountered unexpected harsh weather condition. The ice pack closed in, making it impossible for a ship to sail through the tough ice. And because of this, the ship that was supposed to pick them up never arrived. As months passed, they managed to survive with the food they've stored. But on January 28, 1923, Crawford, Maurer, and Gale left the group to look for help. Knight couldn't go with them since he suffered from scurvy. For the next couple of weeks, the three men never returned and Ada was stuck to take care of Knight. Without anyone to rely on, and no proper knowledge of survival skills, Ada taught herself how to shoot and brought seals for them to eat. She also learned how to set up traps just like her ancestors. She crafted snares to catch arctic foxes, which proved to be a success. She hauled driftwood and chopped it for fire, and even built a lightweight boat to hunt more effectively. At night, she slept right beside her gun, just in case a polar bear came too close to the tent. Despite the effort she did to keep Knight alive, he died on June 23rd. Ada recorded the event in her diary. The day of Mr. Knight's death. He died on June 23rd. I don't know what time he died though. Anyway, I write the day, just to let Mr. Stephenson know what month he died and what day of the month. With his death and the three men who never returned, Ada's only company was the cat, Victoria. The thought of seeing her son again made her strive harder to survive. She continued to push forward, and eventually, two months later, on August 19th, with most of the ice pack dissolved, a ship arrived on the Wrangell Island to rescue her. Ada's return to Alaska caused a huge media attention about her survival story in the Wrangell Island. Media outlets bombarded her with many questions, but she immediately visited her son in the orphanage. The money she received from Stephenson was less than was promised, but it was still enough for Bennett's treatment. After the event, she avoided the spotlight and kept a low profile. Today, she's buried in Anchorage Memorial Park in Alaska, right next to her son's grave. So, an amazing woman. Um, she also took down a polar bear. And I think that she is... I had not heard about her until I read the book. And I think that her story is so significant. And I do love that it's written in her words for the most part, because it's from her diary. So show me a sign. I mentioned before that I was, I had one book that uh, one fiction that was not by an indigenous author. And that's this one. Anne Claire Lizotte is a member of the deaf community, but she is not a member of any of the nations. She did, however, have um, readers from uh, 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 the Wampanoag uh, tribe to read this. So before I tell you about it, I'm going to let the author tell you about it. Hello, my name is Anne Claire Lazant. My first book with Scholastic is Show Me a Sign, 11-year-old Mary Lambert, Lambert lives with her family in a small farming town on Martha's Vineyard. Mary is deaf, but that isn't considered unusual. She lives in a unique community where many people are born deaf. Her family has recently suffered a sudden tragic loss. It's not until an outsider, a scientist, comes to town that Mary begins to understand how unusual her community is compared with the rest of America. She is stolen from her island and must find her way back home. I want deaf kids 
to see, to recognize themselves in the book. And I want hearing kids to see the world from a perspective they may never have thought of before. So it is a wonderful story. It is also historical, lots of historical fiction today. And there really was a community in Martha's Vineyard that had this recessive deaf gene. Uh, but they had developed this sign language and they worked, they uh, participated, they engaged, and it was not uh, very unusual. They accepted each other and Mary is deaf and her father um, was deaf and while her mother and brother were not, many in the community, I think it was one in four, um, were not including the indigenous. Now, in this area, the um, property had been, we're gonna call it sold uh, from the, the uh, Wampanoags, but it was basically exploited. And, but there was a treaty in which they were allowed to stay and, and live and work, but that is coming under fire now. And the author doesn't pull any punches. She doesn't um, shy away from the reality of the time period. Um, Mary's mother is very racist. She has a friend who is very racist. And even Mary has, has to go through some development. It's not until after she is abducted by the scientist and the scientist and others outside of the community treat her as if she's very, very stupid for being deaf. And she's never encountered that before. Um, and she encounters abuse and she has to escape and come home. So this is a very good story. Um, I love how she explains how Mary talks because she actually describes the hand gestures. Um, the author had to do a great deal of studying because there is not much left of the sign language from Martha's Vineyard. Um, so there's a little bit of an afterward. You can get some information about how she did some of that research. It's really, really interesting. Um, here is a brief overview of some of the works that I have cited. Uh, please, please take a look. I hope there's at least one of these books here that you enjoyed. Um, and I will be doing more of these own voices uh, classes for um, middle school literature every month. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great holiday. Thank you.